I want to listen to Pope Francis talk a little bit about capitalism and then get your further reflections on what you think he's getting sure. at here. Those dirty capitalist AI tools make it easier to understand the Pope. Only education in fraternity and concrete solidarity can overcome the increasingly prevalent throwaway culture, which concerns not only a wide array of food and goods, but first and foremost, most importantly, the people who are marginalized by these complex and often impersonal techno-economic systems, where, often without us realizing it, man is no longer at the center, but the products of man, often more valued than human considerations. What's your reaction to what Francis is, Pope Francis is getting at there? Well, I think what Pope Francis is saying echoes earlier pontiffs' criticisms of socialism. Uh, when you look at Pope Leo XIII at the end of the 19th century, just you know, a few decades after uh, Marx and Engels are putting forward things like the Communist Manifesto, and you have the worker uprisings in Paris, and you have socialism growing and people calling for labor revolts, Pope Leo XIII was speaking about how the error of socialism is that the human person doesn't rest at the center of it. Rather, it's these lofty goals of equality, of human beings exist to serve the state, to maximize productivity. That way, uh, what is produced can be equally distributed amongst everyone. Uh, so th their criticisms of early socialism was that the human person is not at the center of it. Rather, it's these particular ideals or essentially planned productivity. And what Pope Francis is saying would also apply to market economies and capitalism. Uh, it, was, it was William F. Buckley who put it really well. He said, the problem with capitalism is capitalists, but the problem with socialism is socialism. There's nothing that you can fix from the system, but because human beings uh, have a sinful nature, we are capable of, of good, but our natural self-interest can be distorted so that we serve our own interests at the expense of others, uh, exploiting other people. And think about it in any workplace, right? There's always that kind of attention. Like the boss would love if people came into the office and worked for free. And the employee would love to go into the office and get paid for not doing anything. So there's always going to be a tension between the two. And in modern economics and market economies, there seeks to be a balance between those, those types of opposing interests. Now, I think what the Pope is getting at here is that in some countries, especially in more developing countries, those who control capital or own businesses can be in more of a position to exploit workers, to conspire. And this is something even Adam Smith recognized in The Wealth of Nations, understanding you know, people treat Smith as if, oh, he's just this unfettered apologist for capitalism. Uh, but even he recognized that merchants could conspire together to, to make prices high or to keep wages low. And I think what the Pope is getting at here is that in some capitalist or market systems, uh, consumers can be carried away by their consumerism and not take into account workers who are being exploited and being kept in conditions that are that are dangerous. I mean, we look, for example, in I want to say, where was it in in, in Burma or it was uh, th that one uh, s factory collapse that happened uh, in Southeast Asia just a few years ago. It was a horrible workers disaster. And I think that many of those in the history of labor are what spurs on common sense regulations and people recognize that, oh, well, it's they want uh, the market to be able to work for everyone. As soon as it works for me, you say, oh, I want it to to work for everyone as well. So when the Pope is speaking uh, in his encyclical Laudato Si, he says that business is a noble vocation directed to producing wealth and improving the world. The question, the problem is, of course, that we're all sinners. And so we need things to help to restrain where self-interest can bleed into selfishness. Well, so in 2013, in Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis wrote, to sustain a lifestyle which excludes others or to sustain enthusiasm for that selfish ideal, a globalization of indifference has developed. The thirst for power and possessions knows no limits. In this system which tends to devour everything which stands in the way of increased profits, whatever is fragile, like the environment, is defenseless before the interests of a deified market which become the only rule. And then he talks a lot about, you know, how inordinate consumption, as he terms it, and this unbridled consumerism combined with inequality um, is what is, in his words, damaging to the social fabric. I mean, this looks like a very uh, intense uh, 
slapdown of a lot of the components of the capitalist system that we live under. What do you also make of specifically, this? How do you uh, that? Specifically, and this also trickle down economics. So, um, yeah. yeah, right. Right. And I think here what is important to remember, and this goes back to Quadragesimo Anno and Pope Pius the the eleventh, uh, who was saying that economics and moral science each apply to their own spheres. So it's always difficult when the Pope speaks on contemporary issues and areas that we would call interventions in the prudential order. So there's going to be areas where the the Catholic Church's authority resides in faith and morals, teaching the doctrines that God has revealed, uh, morals, how are we to live. But we live in a world that is constantly changing. And so when you have the rise of, of new technologies, whether it's bioethical technologies like in vitro fertilization or just new technologies, even 200, even 200 years ago with the rise of the Industrial Revolution and industrial capitalism. It's so very different from what the church had taught for 1800 years. I mean, throughout nearly all of human history, 99% of people lived in poverty or extreme poverty or at least very low poverty. And the few wealthy people were just those who could basically steal or inherit wealth from other people. That's why in the time of Jesus, there was a proverb that said, uh, every thief is sorry, every rich man is a thief or the son of a thief. But you then you had in the, the the 17th, the 18th century, the 19th century, through the division of labor, specification of labor, through the growth of private industrial firms, productive capacity increases, driving down the costs of goods and services, allowing them to be, allowing things that were once only could only be had for for the the wealth. Sorry, the the rich. You had someone like uh, Hosea Wedgwood, for example, during this period. He he was born with like a disability, one of 13 children born into poverty. But he created a pottery service that revolutionized how to take pottery wares that were once only for royalty and making them accessible to the common man. So he invented things like the money back guarantee or catalog sales. Right. And so now you have people can, you know, they can access more goods than they normally wouldn't. So I think when when the Pope speaks on these issues, we have to we have to avoid two extremes. One extreme is to say, oh, the Pope doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not an economist. Why should I care what he has to say? And the other extreme would be everything he says, every advice that he gives on a matter in the prudential order has to be followed. Yeah. And in a document from the church called Donum Veritatis, it says that not that the magisterium, the teaching authorities of the Catholic Church, like the Pope and the bishops, not every suggestion for how the prudential order there should be an intervention is necessarily correct. So it should be it should be given a respectful hearing, but it's not a te authoritative teaching like on faith and morals. So he's now, essentially okay. so he's essentially cool. telling us that um, attempting to. Uh, not give in to our worst consumerist instincts, but rather to seek a sort of asceticism is how we probably ought to live. But he's not necessarily saying that there ought to be any state intervention that forces that. Is that what you're right. saying? Right. Yeah. In many of these documents, these encyclicals, you have to make a distinction between a moral command that's binding on the faithful right. and what might be called an aspirational statement. Okay. Uh, saying that this is something that would that would be an ideal that is proposed rather than impose. And, and I will be honest, I do have a fair amount of disagreements with how Pope Francis speaks about economic problems, uh, because I find that many of the criticisms are very vague, that he might identify a legitimate problem, but the solution or the criticism involved is quite vague, and I'm not sure what he's exactly proposing to remedy the problem. Though I do recognize a, a kernel of a, a legitimate criticism that, that we have to look at. I mean, for example, we have a problem in capitalist societies of companies doing things like planned obsolescence, right? That I remember, I mean, I still have toys that I've given my kids that I that my parents bought for me like in the 1980s that still work. But a lot of, you know, or appliances in my parents' house that still run to, the, to this day. But it seems like everything we buy today, it seems like there's a bit of a conspiracy among corporations to make sure it's going to break in like five years so that you have to buy, you have to buy something else. And I think that's something all of us could agree is a kind of consumerism like it'd be really nice to be able to move away from something like that to better serve the interests of everyone involved so i think he does make a legitimate point here but sometimes i believe the criticisms can be overly broad or overly pessimistic from him when it comes to market economies and i have a bit of a 
honestly, I, I mean, it is more of a psychoanalysis here. I, I'm not saying it's it's the exact solution. But this is a pope who was bishop in Buenos Aires during the Argentinian economic collapse. And we find many people are extremely uh, have a stream, extreme antipathy towards market economies when they go through a, a market collapse. Wait, wait. Uh, so we saw the same thing in the 1930s in the United States, which was called the heyday of American communism. The American Communist Party had its largest growth in members during the Great Depression. No. Uh, you know, the same thing, we saw that growth of young people wanting socialism when? Well, after the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009. I think a lot of that does color Pope Francis's thinking towards market economies when he's when he's speaking about them. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. And please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.